She didn't put it out. All right, good morning. It's about 9 o'clock. I'd like to call this tech meeting um, to order. We, we do have a quorum, although um, Chris Bonifar and Dwayne Taylor were not able to make it this morning, but we're still able to continue. So with that, are there any public comments on the agenda items? All right, seeing none, any conflict of interest declarations? None. And so we move on to approve the minutes of December 4th, 2019. They were posted ahead of time. I had a chance to look at them. I had no concerns. Motion, motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Second. And a second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And so an act, one action today and the rest is informational um, will be the election of the new chair and vice chair. This is something by our rules we have to do annually. So do any of the committee members have any thoughts on those two roles. Mr. Piper, I think you're doing an excellent job, and I would like to nominate you to continue if you're eligible. I haven't been keeping track of how many years. Okay. I don't recall, but I'm happy to, unless anyone else would like to. I, I second that, that motion. <laughs> <laughs> I third it. <laughs> Welcome, new chair. You know, there's there's two people not here. We can we can uh, vote in. Okay, I, I accept. Thank you very much for that confidence. Appreciate it. And the vice chair role. Mr. Fowler, I think you're doing an excellent <laughs> job with that too. So you're, thank you. I nominate Mr. Fowler. I'll, I'll second that one. <laughs> okay, we're all in favor. Aye. Okay, thank you. Appreciate thank you. that. Okay. All right, so that's that order of business is out of the way. So we'd like to move on to item three, King first. And that's going to be Dr. Mary Claire. Welcome. Good morning, how are you? Thank you for having us. Um, we're very excited because we want to share with you the Caring First website and custom application. So we have um, completed the first phase. We want to um, tell you a little bit about the website. And it's really um, a public website for students, parents, and community stakeholders that provide some resources um, that are kind of, we have on our websites, but maybe kind of buried in some of our departments. So this is a way to put kind of a, a family-friendly face forward um, to engage our community stakeholders. So in the second piece, in addition to the website, is the custom application, which is within the website. And it's a custom-built software application for our school behavioral health professionals. That's that new behavioral health role that's in all schools. Potentially our school counselors, our school psychologists, and some of our nonprofit agencies we work with that we refer to as like co-located therapists. And it will be a way to track their activities with all of our students across the district. So the way we did this, um, my department has been working with IT, um, with Kara's team, really designing and creating the website and the custom application. Um, we've been working in a series of sprints. Uh, they have been very wonderful about keeping us on track. Um, each of the department owners, because it's not just about behavioral and mental health, there's other departments that are involved in this. So because it goes across the whole district. So anyone, let's say it's attendance or our foster care or um, multicultural, I engaged with each of the departments, showed them their web um, pages and then got feedback on it. So then approximately 30 principals and district staff previewed the website for us. So we'd like to show it to you. Uh, the website is, um, is done and our application we're working on. So this is, this is the, the landing page of the website. We have a number of different, um, this kind of just orients the um, parents or community member. We have a number of videos that are available for their viewing. Um, it's wonderful because the 
students actually talk about mental health and how it affects them. And then as we navigate uh, the search button, these are the 14 areas that we started with that we thought were most important to parents and community uh, in terms of how to find resources within the district. So if you like click on bullying and prevention, you hover over, it gives you a little uh, synopsis of what's there. But not only it, it tells you what we do for bullying prevention, but it gives you the district contact person, which is April Bullard. And then also they can select their school and then it, it gives the contact information for the school in which um, to report bullying to, okay? And then we have some outside resources as well that um, also connect to our, our district pages. Student support, same thing. This is um, really where we have a lot of um, information, not only from my department, but how to get counseling and support for, for children. And, our, uh, and in that, um, in that portion as well, we have the, our online directory, which has links all of our community resources, and that's all the agencies that we work with. Okay. And then the second part is the application. So this is the part that we're building um, that we hope to have ready um, summer, fall of 2020. And this is a really important piece because the, the first part is just really resources for parents, community, anybody within or, or without the, um, throughout the school district. But this part is so, um, we're so excited about because it allows all of our providers to log in and present, um, really document the information and what they're doing with students. We have no way of tracking um, all of the behavioral and mental health services that are provided to students. Each department tracks things a little bit differently. Some have some databases, some have paper forms, some have Google Docs. Um, this is a way to really bring all of our behavioral health people together. Um, we're starting with behavioral health professionals, which are located in every school. That's the new role that um, was hired out of referendum dollars. And they're piloting now in six schools. So if we click on the door, only a behavioral health professional with that role will have access. And then they can, they can click on what services they're providing to individual students, groups, and additional activities they're doing throughout the school that um, support social emotional learning. So we're very excited. We're developing um, reports as well for each of the groups so that we'll be able to have real time data. Uh, so when board members or anyone else asks us what's happening in schools and how many kids are being serviced and what type of activities are being provided, we're gonna be able to have that. Okay. So you can see we can drop down by student name. It also does by student number, um, cross-references with each of the schools. All of the, um, the behavioral health professionals will only have access to the school they're working in unless they ha they're a district employee and work across a number of schools. And also our um, outside agencies that have agreements with us will also have access. Uh, to, to log uh, student services. So that's really the application. We're very excited about it. We're, um, we have right now, you see that the one door is kind of lit up because that's our pilot. We're moving to co-located agencies next, um, then the school psychologists, school counselors, and then outside agencies as well. Any questions? Do school psychologists have access to this? Are they using it? They are not using it presently. Um, we're piloting with behavioral health professional, but they are definitely in a group. Um, I'm working with the manager and uh, Kevin McCormick on logging their services here as well. And it's not the services that they just do for testing because we do have a platform for that, but there's a variety of services that they do provide that there's no way to capture. And this, this would give us that. Okay, great, thank you. Do you, do you have a time rough time when you might implement that? We're, we're hoping by fall of 2020. Okay, thank you. Uh, how is the access limited? So like the behavioral health specialists, can they only see the students in their school? Or? Yes, it's gonna be um, limited by role, their limited. role type and title, and, and where they're located. Thanks. Do you wanna ask one more question along that same line? Mm -hmm. So, great. It looked like it was behind a login, which, which was awesome. What about the, the back end? 
querying ability of all that data. I'm going to pass in, that to Kara. <laughs> in, in reports, and I just, yeah. it I'm looks sorry, like you'll collect it? some sensitive information in the back end and the ability to report on that same data. Is it relying on the same kind of credentialing that you, yes. okay. Yes. Good. Okay, and, and along that same lines, I'm assuming this is an all internal app, right? It's not anything that's out in the cloud or anywhere like that. It's on premises. Okay. Any further questions? Nice job. Thank you. Very Thank good. You. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So next, we'd like to do an update on uh, eSports and Dr. Adam Miller. Please present. Good morning, everyone. Uh, up here presenting with me is uh, Mr. John Shoemaker, one of our amazing EdTech specialists. Um, he's going to be pr providing most of the presentation. I'm just going to kind of do a little intro. Um, Okay. So um, eSports, we've all heard of it. When I heard about it, I was like, ah, you know, I played video games when I was in middle school and high school. Okay, that's all it is. Um, but I'm going to share a little story about when I realized it was more than just video games. Uh, so last year, I was in the Boca Mall. Um, wife was shopping, and I had nothing to do. So I, I kind of found the Microsoft Store. And at that exact moment at the Microsoft Store, they had a little eSports competition going on in their store. So I had heard about it. I'm like, well, let me, I got plenty of time. Um, so let me sit around and see what's going on. So um, I kind of viewed it from three different angles. The first angle is I looked at the individual players. Just to set you up, there was about 20 uh, people on computers playing games. Um, and there was a big screen in the back where you can zoom in onto particular players, seeing them play. And then it was a large crowd watching. So um, looking at the individual players, it just looked like they were playing a video game on a really fancy computer, right? Look cool. They're playing a game called League of Legends, if you've never heard of it. Um, it's a group kind of strategy game. Um, so I was like, oh, they're really good video game players. So then I took a step back and looked at, um, there was a, in League of Legends, you have a group of four or five people playing on a team, trying to basically, basically capture the flag of the other team. And I started noticing that the uh, players were communicating with each other. They had practiced, just like sports teams do, different strategies that they were trying to implement against the other teams. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. You know, usually video games are just you by yourself. But they were communicating, they were collaborating, they were critical thinking and problem solving together um, as they were trying to defeat the other teams, which was really cool. Um, so I was like, ah, oh, it's, it's strategy. It's, like teamwork um, and it's problem solving. But then I step back even further, and this is, I think, the real key for eSports, um, the crowd. Um, the, the, the people playing, they were some high schoolers, this was a weekend, don't worry, and there were some older kids. Um, that, you know, they, they might not have looked like the coolest people ever playing these video games, but the crowd was cheering them on. They were getting so much positive support like a football player would or a basketball player would. Um, I'll be honest, some of it I didn't understand when they won something, <laughs> um, but um, they were getting cheered on and that um, positive social interaction and positive um, support from people that they didn't know, they, they were rock stars. Um, and that's when I realized eSports was more than just a game. Um, it's really a way to support students in another fashion of sports. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Shoemaker. Thank you. Hmm. Um, thank you for having me, everyone. Um, so one of the things that we know of is that we do a school uh, effectiveness questionnaire every year for our students, the SEQ. And we know that almost 30% of our students have not one adult on their campus they can talk to. Um, so we know that we need to be relevant to our students and to their needs. But when you look at that number, the 30% ends up being about 57,000-ish students who don't have one person at the adult level that they can talk to on their campus. So we need to come up with ways that we can engage these students more and learn more about those students. So what we ended up doing is we brought in Full Sail University this past fall to do two tech fests at two of our high schools. And part of the tech fest was an actual esports competition. And in, in that eSports competition, we met someone named Brooke, 
And Brooke is a student at Jupiter High. She is a senior, uh, very shy, introverted, quiet, very polite, but rarely would make eye contact with, with teachers. Um, and so we met her when they did the competition at the school and we could see she was quiet, but she remained calm under pressure, right? And so what happened with the Tech Fest is the top three students in each period actually got to go to Full Sail University to compete against the 17 other high schools that Full Sail visited. And so Brooke was one of those students, and so they took the team up to Full Sail University. And so when we got there, in November, it was really interesting when we talked to the media specialist who was serving as the coach, when she told us the story how this girl was totally a different kid after this competition, and the, it allowed her to not just connect with more than one adult on campus because of this, but it also brought her out of her shell. And so uh, I wanna share one story that Brooke had uh, while she was up there about how she designed their t-shirts for the team. I see you have this design for your shirt here. And tell us about this design. Um, so my, well, so Miss Potts over here, well, who funded well. this whole ex expedition. So shout out to you. Thank you so much for letting me. Um, so she comes up to me in first hour and she's like, "Hey, I'll give you an hour. I literally just make a shirt like right now." I'm like, Hello. So second hour, I'm in economics class and I'm like, I have um. My, my economics worksheet, and then under my desk I have a piece of paper, and I'm like, smash ball time. Uh, so then, yeah. Um, then third hour, I luckily had access to a computer, so I'm like, all right, Photoshop, let's go. And then, uh, yeah, and then I just ran over, and I was like, here. So you can see she was using a lot of different skills, obviously. Um, smash ball, if you don't know, is the game that they were playing. So that's kind of like the circle you see on her shirt. Um, so Brooke actually made it to the final round. Um, at Full Sail University, and she ended up placing second, where she got a $5,000 scholarship, a medal, um, you know, for, for playing this. And so we really saw a whole different student just in that small amount of time between the time that we were, were at the school and then two weeks later when we were up at, at Full Sail University. But she's not the only student in this small event that was impacted. Adam will share another story about Mario. Sure, so um, I didn't know Mario, Mario before this event, but I, um, he was one of the students that made it to Full Sail. Um, I didn't actually talk to Mario, but I spoke to his dad. Um, we were kind of on the sidelines watching as this was unfolding at the, uh, at the big arena up in Orlando. And um, Mario's dad said to me, you know, I'm so glad this happened. I'm so glad we're starting, um, that, you know, that we could start an eSports club at Mario's school um, because he had no friends. He had absolutely no friends. Um, the dad had reached out to the principal, to the teachers, to the school counselors, and they were all trying to help Mario, but he had no friends that were interested in what was he was interested in. But when he came to the eSports competition, he all of a sudden found other f students his age that um, liked the same things he did, which happened to be eSports. Um, so da the dad said, thank goodness, because I was gonna take Mario out of school um, and uh, take him someplace else. Um, so that was a huge positive interaction and success story just from this one specific event around eSports. So obviously that's just two stories from this group of students. Um, there are a whole bunch of different student uh, stories that the, the media specialist was sharing with me uh, after the event, which was a lot of fun. But it allows us to see that students who typically don't have that adult, this is one way to engage students who typically are not engaged in schools right now, right? Um, so we do wanna thank Full Sail for hosting those events. They're actually gonna host four more events this, this spring in April. Um, and again, they're, they're doing the same thing where the top three students from each period will be able to go up to their arena and compete to, uh, to win another scholarship for their school. So we appreciate that. But then we start thinking about, so why are we continuing to do this? And so we go with a group called NASEF. We've been working with them, the North American Scholastic Esports Federation. They're a high school uh, esports league. And they really believe that, and I love that the way they say this, is that esports is the Trojan horse that allows us to reach the students who are typically not engaged with school. So our goal is to actually engage those students who typically don't stay after school. Most of the students we're talking about are ones that will go straight home and hop on their own video game system. 
So why not engage those students in teaching them like the bullying prevention you talked about? Those are those SEL skills that we talk about in school that we can be doing this in a way that engages those students. It allows us to expose them to STEAM programs and careers and work on the soft skills that we always talk about as well, but also allow us to be relevant to those students. So if you're not sure what eSports is yet, basically it's competitive video gaming, right? That's the easiest way to, to narrow it down. It's one of the fastest growing sports in the world. This is an actual competition you're seeing on the screen here. That's how many people are actually watching people play. This is an adult level tournament. Um, but it's actually becoming larger than the Super Bowl. The last League of Legends tournament had more viewers than our last Super Bowl. So it really is something that is happening out there in the world. It's not just this playing video games thing. So what we know though is that we don't want to focus just on a video game, right? We don't want to focus on kids playing video games. So we look at the entire ecosystem beyond the game player, right? So an esports team essentially needs all the things that a regular sports <laughs> team needs. So for example, you have things like marketing, you have social media, all of those types of things to get the word out about the team. Some of our programs like at Jupiter High or Wellington could incorporate these types of skills to teach students that this is a career that you can go into right now. We have the IT side of things, making sure that everything's working and connected and all the back end support stuff. And then you have the, the streaming, they're called shoutcasters. It's essentially just like a broadcaster on ESPN or any other sports show, they call the play by play of what's happening. So that is an actual position on these teams. So you can see we're not just looking at the player, we're looking at the entire ecosystem surrounding this. And we know that esports has actually gotten started uh, at the adult level, and video games have been around for years, but there have been ways now that we can actually make it easier to watch it. Uh, colleges and universities were really picking up on this as well. They kind of jumped on board. And so right now there's over 200 colleges and universities offering scholarships, offering courses on eSports. You can get degrees in eSports. And uh, many of these schools are also very local to us. Um, we have Kaiser University that has a team that we went and visited. FAU is building a, a team and an arena as well. So it is definitely growing around here. And even the US Army is using eSports to train um, their, their, their soldiers. So it's really an interesting way to get people engaged. So with that, we were able to obtain some funding to start some teams. The Pew Foundation started off the, the, the the donations to get three teams at Lakes, Glade Central, and Santa Lucia's. And then we were able to get some alternative funding for Jupiter and West Boca Raton. And so right now we're in the process of getting a coach at the school to be the point of contact that will serve as the after school person. And from there we'll start building these teams. We have some trainers coming in to actually train the coaches on how to actually run a team instead of just playing the game. It's more than that. So um, they will go through a training that they will then learn how to actually serve as the esports coach. And I know the question that most people ask is what games we're gonna be playing. Um, so if you're familiar with the games, we're gonna be doing League of Legends, Rocket League, and Smash Brothers to start off with. We will not be doing any kind of first person shooter. So no Fortnite, no Overwatch, nothing like that. Um, these games primarily come out of what the high school leagues are doing. So what we would like to do is to have the students actually participate in competitions against local schools to then go to state and national level just like other sports. So um, these are the games that are currently being run at the high school league level and hopefully will then allow them to get into a college as an esports uh, player. In addition to that, we talked about NACEF. NACEF actually offers a full curriculum for language arts, which is actually an approved curriculum in California, but they're also working on alignments to career tech ed, so CTE classes, out of school time, and also down at the middle school level as well. So um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the esports world at, at the high school level, but it's still really on the cutting edge. So we're gonna try to pilot it and then see how to standardize because we know our students are, are going to the principals at the schools. Adam has told me multiple times of principals calling because the students want to have these clubs on their campus. So we would like to do the pilot to standardize it and let the, the other schools then just join in as we go on from there. So with that, we can ask any questions that you have. 
I have a couple. First, I want to compliment you on the uh, PowerPoint. It was it was a really good one. I don't Thank know. You. So if you put that together, job I well done. That. Second, I can see this as a, as a modality or something that the people involved in Caring First that were just here could use, so I hope you're working with them. Yeah, I just learned about that when I was reading the agenda the other day, so that's, that's awesome. And, and the third thing, and I don't think you're there yet, but probably about 20 years ago, my wife and I worked with, uh, with uh, Palm Beach County Parks and Recreation to put on a special, for Special Olympics, using technology and computers on there. So this might be some way you could end up working with them as you get things squared away. Yeah, um, some, of the thing, some of the feedback we've actually heard is a lot of ESE students really are drawn to eSports. Um, they, uh, especially on the autism spectrum, they're really focused and they hyper-focus on the games. So we are working with ESE as well to, uh, to see possibly a full ESE team. One of our goals is also, Adam would love to try to get a 25% female participation on our teams. So that's gonna be a goal that the coaches will work towards as well. Um, in the agenda, there's actually a, a, a handout, just so you know, that, that covers the 10 objectives of our grant, so you can see that as well, but thank you all. We'll, we'll, we'll look into Special Olympics as well. All right, thank you. I think it's awesome you have a stated goal of 25% of female players. <laughs> so I hope you, uh, I hope you reach that. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate or inappropriate, but I, I would love if, if, if we could do the same presentation at Palm Beach Tech in the community. Okay. Because I, I learned a lot. I didn't know about the 30%. Absolutely. That was astounding to me, um, that 30% of the students don't have an adult to go to. But I, but I think the broader awareness in the community would probably support the cause of yeah. at your yeah, convenience, of course. To. Okay. Sure. We did work with the STEM team um, and the STEM Ed Council. She brought in Mesa to do a full presentation to the STEM Ed Council. But yeah, I mean, if you want us to share it with anyone else, please let us know. And Adam and I will definitely, mm -hmm. we'd love to. Other questions? Excellent presentation. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We do have that website that's up there. It's currently a little bare right now. It's coming soon, but it's also in the agenda. So please feel free to follow along with what we're doing there. So thank you. Okay, next we'd like to invite um, Mr. David Willem up to provide a bandwidth update. So you just, did just think of a question for Adam and John. Adam left. John. John. Oh, sorry. Are we going to have a team? Hey, yes, Adam, <laughs> I think I would love to have a team up here. I think we should. I think we should have a team like the geezers or the dinosaurs or, or something like that. Why the systems are up and yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we need to test it. <laughs> we need to test it from an infrastructure standpoint. I think we should be playing against the kids. So. Yeah, so Adam, Adam always says it's going to be IT versus ET in some of these competitions. <laughs> yeah, we got Dawn as our female participants, so we'll be the Sasquatches. Um, all right, so I have two updates. Uh, most of it's based on referendum. Um, we have bandwidth first, but let me go to referendum first. It's just a single PowerPoint. Either one, it, they're both the same. Okay. So referendum, so I guess this is a quarterly referendum IT infrastructure update. Now that we're doing it quarterly. So as y'all know, we have um, 33.8 million dedicated to us, allocated to us over 10 years. Uh, we, we've spent about 25.6% of that up to date uh, over these five different categories. Backend infrastructure replacement is going very well. Um, this includes anything for, you know, EDW, PeopleSoft, Portal, uh, anything within this data center, the South ITV data center, and the uh, Northwest Regional data center. Uh, basically, we, we replace all the compute memory, uh, the SAN storage, um, backup hardware. So we've done that here at this location and at South ITV. Uh, we actually had folks up at Northwest Regional last week replacing the backup hardware, and we're going to be replacing out the uh, physical in infrastructure up there uh, by the end of the month. So all those refreshes have gone uh, very well. Um, so everything within our data centers is, is basically up to date. Um, yeah, next project is going to be planning for the FHESC update again. 
school network routers, switches, and cabling. Uh, this is an ongoing project that we've had ongoing for several, several years now. Um, the cabling replacement, we've done 107 schools. Uh, that's, that's moving the cabling. Most of the cabling in the schools is over 20 years old. Right? So we, we're going in, we're replacing the cabling, getting it up to the latest, uh, the latest specs. Uh, hopefully it's going to last another 20 years for us and I'll never have to do a, a cabling replacement again. Hopefully I'm just sitting drinking Mai Tais somewhere. But uh, we follow that up with a core switch replacement. We come in behind it, we replace out the core, the core routers at, at all the sites. Uh, we've done about 81 schools as of right now. Um, so uh, that's getting us up to a, a 10 gig speed at the schools. Uh, the, the cabling that we are putting in the schools is capable up to 100, so it should last another 20 years. So we're going to continue with that project, uh, hopefully finish that off within the next year, and then future projects moving on to IDF switch replacements. Those are the, the IDFs um, talk to the MDFs, which is where the core is at. The IDFs are what support the jacks and the ports in the school rooms, right? So when you plug in a computer or, you, or the access points, it goes to the IDF. Uh, we'll probably stay at one gig speeds for that for the next five years, but the equipment's old, it, it needs replaced, and uh, we're going to move forward with that. This is all E-rate, by the way, too. Mm, excuse me. Uh, ser school server replacement. Um, like I said last time, we got a year off. All the schools have been updated uh, within the last five years. We're currently planning to replace the high schools again. Uh, fiscal, fiscal year 22, um, we're, we're already starting to plan for the next generation of servers that are going to be going in. So, you know, uh, that supports school food services, everything local at the schools. Uh, it's, it's also something that we need at the schools for things like school police initiatives that are coming in. We have to have a, a local infrastructure at the school that talks back to us. Anything local. Uh, will definitely help out of the school for things, for the what if, what if scenarios. You know, what if we lose internet? What if we lose the ASE? What if, what if something happens? So we have the, the local server at the school to help support and keep the school running in the event of, you know, a cut or a power outage or, or what have you. So school phone system at PBX, this is probably the largest project that we have uh, going on. And this has been going fantastic. I, I can't say enough about um, Al and the, and the project management group with that. Uh, we've done 19, it says 19, we did 20. Spanish River was cut yesterday. So we have 20 of the 23 high schools completed now. Uh, it's going very well. Uh, our schedule was to complete all the high schools by March. We're going to. We're definitely going to meet that schedule. We're going to switch it up a little bit with school testing coming on. We were going to move on to um, middle schools. Even though the phone replacement has nothing to do with testing, we want to stay out of their schools, just have you know, no presence there while they're doing testing. So we came up with a list of 25 elementary schools that we're going to do from March until the end of the year, and then go back to the middle schools. We should complete the middle schools. Right now it looks like October is when we're going to have that done. And then the remaining elementary schools and the district offices will be completed in fiscal year 22, uh, calendar year 21. One other thing with this, um, we have a communication coming out probably within the next couple of weeks where as part of this upgrade, we're, we're going to implement the dial plan uh, as of right now. So all schools will move to seven digit dialing. And part of the reason for that is caller ID uh, and Another reason for that is going to be just getting people used to doing the seven-digit dialing. We removed five-digit PXs out of um, out of the form, uh, or I'm sorry, out of the uh, the directory, and we've been pushing people to get ready for the seven-digit dialing. And working with AT&T this week, we've come up with a plan to move forward with that. This project's going very well. Still, no no major complaints, at least that I've heard. And the last one is wireless access point replacement. Um, high schools and middle schools have all been replaced. Uh, we're currently working on element, elementary schools. We've only got three completed. And the reason we only have three completed is because we are waiting for USAC approval, E-rate approval. 
we were ready to go in July. They finally, finally came in uh, last month and gave us approval to move forward with, with uh, that project. Um, that's all being done by contractors. Uh, E-rate, again, we're able to use the E-rate dollars to pay the contractors. It's all being done at night, weekends, to not disrupt school. So it's going to take a while, but hopefully the elementary schools are, are completed in this next year. The future project for that is also going to be E-rate planning uh, for what's to come in the next five years and the 802.11ax standard, which is also called Wi-Fi 6. Wi-Fi 6 is going to be a small increase in speed, but what that's going to, the, the main thing with 11ax is density. It's going to provide uh, more paths, more lanes for the, the, the way the data travels um, from the access points out. So that's a big deal for us with the density in the schools and the way we handle things. Um, I watch a lot of TV, so if you've seen the Verizon commercial where they talk about uh, going from a two-lane dirt road to a six-lane highway, think of it in that manner. That's, that's what we're doing. So we'll be able to support uh, many more students in the classrooms. We keep adding more and more technology into these classrooms. I think the last count was 156,000 Chrome devices. So um, having the infrastructure in place to support these devices, as well as people carrying in their iPhones, uh, their, you know, their Google phones, whatever, what have you. You know, I have three devices in this room right now. So um, it, it's going to help with the density situation. Also with uh, online learning going to 4K, 8K videos, things like that, and getting more, uh, more density in the classrooms. So those are, those are the five. Any questions on those? Okay. Real quick, we'll do the internet bandwidth increase. So like I said, we're bringing more and more devices into the classrooms, right? Um, school police has initiatives for IOT devices for um, uh, their security projects, doing bells, doing uh, door locks, things over the internet. So we're going to see more usage uh, and all the ed edu educational technology programs that they're doing, uh, the success makers, the iReadies, things like that, they're going to have more enriched content. So again, the 4K, 8K videos. And then we're going to have students, every student now, at some point is going to have um, you know, a device in their hand. So we're going from a, a single teacher presenting on a screen to an entire class having the ability to look at the same content. So we, we basically increase 30 times. So if we have 30 kids in a classroom, everyone's looking at the same thing, and it's going out to the internet, we've got to increase our bandwidth. You can see the trend line there. This is over the last, this is since 2018. And we're trending up. Uh, the trend in 2018 was about 6 to 8, and now we're seeing about 10 to 12. So it's increasing slowly, but it is going to pick up, and we anticipate um, a, a much larger increase, again, because of the devices in the classrooms and then the, just the general usage of it. Uh, Internet is fairly cheap for us, so I will say that, and i got a slide on that. But... Uh, if, if you notice, we're not at capacity at all. Um, we're at 32 gig, moving from 24, and our usage is 10 to 12 a day. The reason we do that, we have four pipes. If we lose a pipe, which happened in December, AT&T had a fiber cut, we lost a pipe, we're able to handle the load. We want to serve our customers, which is basically classrooms. We want to make sure that they keep working and keep doing what they need to do and then we do it again for uh, in case we lose two pipes, which happened in December. So even losing, even having two fiber cuts, we were able, two fiber cuts on the same day was just ridiculous. If we had a third one, obviously we wouldn't be able to keep up, but uh, that would be like an end of world scenario, and I, I'd probably quit on that day if that did happen. But two happening did happen in December. We weathered the storm, uh, and, and we were able to keep going. The other reason we do this is for DDoS. We get DDoS all the, t all the time. It used to be a major problem that we had. So we diversified by going to FLR and AT&T, two providers, and by increasing capacity. We still get DDoSed all the time, but nobody knows it because we mitigated it. 
and we don't have those problems anymore. So learned a lot in the last four years here doing this stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. But uh, we, we are increasing the bandwidth. We're going to 32. We're not doubling. We have finally caught up. We're maintaining now. So like I said, with the cost of increasing the bandwidth, it's really only going to cost us about 13000 a year, which is ridiculous for the amount of internet that we have. And this is 32 gig a second. So think of your phone plan again. You know, most people have unlimited, but if you have a 40 gig plan, we burn through that in one second. One second. So um, the demands of this district are crazy. It's huge. Uh, but for us, the, the price after the E-rate discount moving from um, six to eight on, every, on each of our four pipes is only gonna be about 13,000 a year. That's all we got. Any questions on that? Great, thank you very much for the update. All right, thank you. Okay, so the agenda was, was light uh, today. We, we know we man, made a mention last meeting that the meetings will be quarterly. So the next meeting is scheduled for June 3rd. Um, unless something comes up and necessitates a, an interim meeting, we'll send out by email and invite you to that. Otherwise, the next meeting is June 3rd. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? I'd like to adjourn the meeting. Motion. Second. Adjourn. Thank you. Thank you.